Today, we're going to solve a really cool problem, which will bring us from number theory to probability and calculus. The question is this, what's the probability that two randomly chosen positive integers are relatively prime? To be relatively prime means that the two numbers have no common factor greater than one. For example, the greatest common divisor of 15 and 28 is equal to 1. 15 has factors of 1, 3, 5, and 15, and 28 has factors of 1, 4, 7, 14, and 28. Their greatest common factor is 1. So we would say that 15 and 28 are relatively prime, which we also say is co-prime. That's another word for it. So certainly notice two numbers don't have to be prime for them to be relatively prime. So again, the question is, what's the probability that two randomly chosen positive integers are relatively prime? This is pretty difficult when you think about it, because if we're randomly choosing two positive integers, well, there's infinitely many positive integers we could choose. And since we don't know how big they are, there are infinitely many potential factors they could have. So where do we even begin? Well, we need to start with some basic tools of probability that we'll need to solve this problem. The first is a basic law of probability called the law of complement. If the probability of an event A is equal to P, then the probability of the event A not occurring naturally is equal to one minus P. For example, if we're rolling a six sided die, the probability of rolling a six is one out of six because the die has six sides. They're all equally likely to come up and only one of those six sides shows a six. So the probability of rolling a six is one over six. What's the probability of not rolling a six? Well, it would just be all of the other probability. So one minus a six, or of course, five sixths, representing the five other sides of the die that don't show six. When we're talking about an event, it can either happen or not happen. So together, those probabilities need to add to one. So indeed, the probability of an event not occurring is one minus the probability that it does occur. The other basic probability law that we need is this, the joint probability of n independent events. That means the events have no effect on each other, like flips of a coin, for example. One flip doesn't affect the results of the next flip. The joint probability of n independent events is the product of their individual probabilities. So for example, if I'm flipping three coins and I want to know what's the probability that we get three heads, well, flipping heads has a probability of one half. The coins are all independent. One flip doesn't affect the next flip. So to find the joint probability of three heads, that's just going to be the product of the individual probabilities. The probability that the first coin is heads is one half. The probability that the second coin is heads is one half. And the probability that the third coin is heads is one half. Thus multiplying those individual probabilities, we get the joint probability of all three coins showing heads as one eighth. Now, we will need some more mathematical machinery besides this, but this is enough to get us started. Let's say we have our two randomly chosen positive integers m and n. When trying to figure out if they have any factors in common, it's sufficient, of course, to just consider their prime factors. So let's say we have this prime number p. It's just an arbitrary prime. We may ask then, how likely is it that this prime number p divides m. That is, how likely is it that p is a factor of m? Well, when you think about the sequence of all positive integers, certainly every pth integer would be a multiple of p. For example, if p was the prime number 3, well, when we list out the positive integers, every third number is a multiple of 3. 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3. And so on. So in that example, one third of all integers are divisible by 3. And so in general, one out of every p integers will be divisible by a prime number p. And so we can write that the probability that this prime number p divides m, that's what this notation means, you can just read it as m being a multiple of p or p is a factor of m. The probability of that is one over p. Again, that's because every pth integer is going to be a multiple of this prime number p. 
of course, by the same logic, the probability that this arbitrary prime p is a factor of that other positive integer n is also 1 out of p. Of course, the larger the prime number p is, the less likely these positive integers are to have it as a factor, because there are just fewer integers that are multiples of larger primes. They're further spaced apart for larger primes. Now, if m and n were both multiples of this prime number p, certainly m and n wouldn't be relatively prime. So how likely is that? What's the probability that this arbitrary prime p is a factor of both m and n. Well, certainly the probabilities are independent. Whether or not m is a multiple of p has nothing to do with whether or not n is a multiple of p. So in fact, we can just multiply these two probabilities together. The probability that p divides m, that is p is a factor of m, and p is a factor of the other positive integer n is just 1 over p times 1 over p, the product of the individual probabilities, which of course is 1 over p squared. So let's use the law of complement, because really we're interested in this not being a common factor of m and n. What's the probability that m and n don't have this prime number p as a common factor? Well, we know the probability that they do have it as a common factor is 1 over p squared. So we can use the law of complement to say that the probability they don't have it as a common factor is 1 minus this. The opposite of m and n having p as a common factor is that p is not a factor of m or p is not a factor of n. As long as at least one of these statements is true, then m and n will not have p as a common factor. And again, by the law of complement, the probability of this is 1 minus 1 over that prime p squared. Now, of course, we know by the fundamental theorem of arithmetic that every positive integer greater than 1 can be written as a unique product of its prime factors. So when determining if two positive integers have any factors in common, we only need to worry about the prime factors. And now we already know how likely two positive integers are to have an arbitrary prime p as a common factor, and more importantly, how likely it is that they don't have it as a common factor. Then, for m and n to have no common factors at all, it's sufficient for them to have no common prime factors, which means we would need this probability to occur for all prime numbers. So we already have an answer to our question. What's the probability that two randomly chosen positive integers will be relatively prime? That is, they have no common factors other than one. Well, it would be one minus one over two squared, the probability that they don't have two as a common factor, multiplied by one minus one over three squared, the probability that they don't have three as a common factor, multiplied by one minus one over five squared, the probability they don't have five as a common factor, and so on, continuing to eliminate all the prime numbers as possible common factors that the two positive integers could have. So by multiplying all of these factors together, we're finding the probability that two randomly chosen positive integers don't have a single prime number as a common factor, and thus can't possibly have any common factor greater than one, and thus would be relatively prime. So this is the probability, but it's a somewhat unsatisfying answer answer since we have no clue what this is actually equal to. It's an infinite product of things. It's just not super insightful without some additional mathematics. Now this is where we basically pull a rabbit out of a hat. I need you to consider this series. It's the sum of reciprocals of squares. 1 over 1 squared, which is 1, plus 1 over 2 squared, plus 1 over 3 squared, plus 1 over 4 squared, and so on. Suppose we take this infinite sum and multiply it by this infinite infinite product. So that looks like this. We have this infinite sum of the reciprocals of squares, and it's getting multiplied by this infinite product of 1 minus 1 over p squared for all prime numbers p. The claim that we're going to justify, and that will be the key to our solution, is that this is equal to to one. Now, how could such a wacky product actually be equal to one? Well, what we're gonna do is multiply this 
by this factor first. We'll see what that's equal to and see that things get a little bit simpler. And then we'll take what we have and multiply it by this next factor, see how it continues to simplify and eventually identify a pattern to confirm our result. All right, so like I said, we're beginning by taking that sum of the reciprocals of the squares and we're multiplying it by that first factor from the infinite product, one minus one over two squared. Now, of course, if we distribute everything through and hit this one, the one is just going to give us this series again. We'll have the sum of the reciprocals of the squares. So let's start there. So multiplying this series by one, we would just get the series again. But then what happens when we multiply this series by negative one over two squared? Well, first we would have one times negative one over two squared. So that would give us a negative one over two squared, which could cancel out with that original term from the series. Then we'd multiply negative one over two squared by one over two squared, thus giving us minus one over four squared, which would cancel out with that term. Then we'd have negative one over two squared times one over three squared, which would give us negative one over six squared, which would also cancel out a term from the series. And we see how this pattern would continue, basically canceling out all of those multiples of two, if you know what I mean. One over two squared, four squared, six squared, eight squared, and so on. So then if we move on to the next multiplication, our series, which was the sum of the reciprocals of the squares, has now lost all of those terms with the even numbers in the denominator. So now it looks like this, one plus one over three squared, plus one over five squared, plus one over seven squared, and so on. And we're multiplying this by that factor from our infinite product that has the next prime number in the denominator, one minus one over three squared. As you may be able to predict, this multiplication is going to end up knocking out all the multiples of three, so to speak, in this sum. One over three squared, one over nine squared, and so on. Many of the multiples of three were already eliminated with the previous multiplication. For example, one over six squared, because six is a multiple of two. One over 12 squared, because 12 is a multiple of two. But this is going to get rid of the rest of them. Again, the multiplication by one at first would preserve the entire series. But then as we distribute the negative one over three squared through this series, we will start to eliminate those remaining multiples of three. Negative one over three squared times one will give us the negative one over three squared to cancel out with that term. And then negative one over three squared times one over three squared is going to give us negative one over nine squared and cancel out with that. The next term would be negative one over three squared times one over five squared which would give us negative one over 15 squared, which would also cancel out with a term. After all of that cancellation, the series would look like this. One plus one over five squared plus one over seven squared, and so on, where all we have left for these terms in the denominator are numbers that are not multiples of two and not multiples of three. And then when we move on to the next multiplication by one minus one over five squared, we would get rid of all remaining multiples of five, one over five squared, one over 25 squared, and so on. Now notice from a greater point of view what this series is made up of. It's one plus a bunch of reciprocals of squares, which are pretty small numbers. Like this one is one over 169. That's pretty tiny and they only get smaller from there. It's one plus a bunch of small stuff. And as we continue with the multiplication, as we discussed, more and more of these will cancel out. In the long run, all of them get canceled out eventually. That's because this infinite product that's canceling out the terms has all of those prime numbers in the denominator. So in the end, all of these would go away eventually, which is to say that it approaches one. Because again, it's one plus a bunch of small stuff and the small stuff is only getting smaller as the product continues. Hopefully then you are satisfied with our reasoning that this infinite product is indeed equal to one. So then how can we find this probability that answers our original question? Well, we know that the probability is this product here. 
So all we have to do is take one and divide it by this infinite sum. Then we'll have one side of the equation that only has the product which represents the probability we're looking for. And on the other side, we'll have one divided by this infinite sum. So if we can just agree to call the probability that we're looking for P, what we have is that P is equal to one over one plus one over two squared plus one over three squared plus one over four squared and so on. And of course, this is where some more mathematical machinery comes in. The year was 1650 when a fellow by the name of Pietro Mengele posed this as a problem to figure out what this infinite sum is equal to. If we could figure out what this infinite sum was equal to, we would have our desired probability. Calculating the value of this sum ourselves is a little bit beyond the scope of this video, so we're not going to do it. But if you're familiar with calculus 2 and determining if series converge or not, we can easily show that this series does converge to some particular value using the integral test. Of course, it's a sum of infinitely many terms, so in these situations, it's it's not obvious that this sum approaches anything at all. It may just get arbitrarily large. I mean, we are adding infinitely many positive numbers together. But for those familiar with calculus, this is a little application of the integral test, which does indeed confirm that this series is convergent. This is what we call a p-series, with p equal to 2. Now, thankfully, of course, we don't have to evaluate this sum ourselves because Leonard Euler already did it. At the spry age, of 28 in 1734, Leonard Euler showed that this series is actually equal to pi squared divided by 6. That is in fact just one value of what later came to be known as the Riemann zeta function. Zeta of a real number s that's greater than 1 is equal to this infinite sum. 1 over 1 to the s plus 1 over 2 to the s plus 1 over 3 to the s and so on. So in fact, this is the Riemann zeta function evaluated at s equals 2. This function is central to the most significant unsolved problem in mathematics today, the Riemann hypothesis. So that's all really cool, but let's bring it together with the gift of Leonard Euler. We know that the probability we seek is 1 divided by pi squared over 6, which of course is the same as 6 over pi squared. Of course, you're likely curious what this is actually equal to in a more comprehensible manner. It's about a probability of 0.61 or 61%. So maybe that's surprising to you, maybe not, but it is actually more likely than not that if we randomly select two positive integers, they will be relatively prime. That is, they'll have no factors in common that are greater than one. So that's pretty incredible. Who would have thought just thinking about if two randomly chosen integers are likely to have a common factor other than one would lead to something with pi. Well, perhaps if you've done enough math, who would think it would lead to anything else? Let me know in the comments if you have any questions and be sure to subscribe for more of the swankiest math videos on the internet. Speak my poetry to your face, it's not in the mid if you ain't listening, not infinite if you ain't really in the